Hello and welcome to Merthyr's Hidden Past, a weekly podcast brought to you by Cavartha Castle Museum and Art Gallery. My name is Christopher Parry and I work at Cavartha Castle and this podcast is all about the history of Merthyr Tidville, the borough and the town where Cavartha Castle is situated along with a great many other things. Um, If you haven't listened before, then we are a fair few episodes in now, so you can access the past episodes by going to kavartha.com and clicking the downloadable content tab at the top of the page, and that'll take you to uh, clickable links for all the previous episodes. Last week we talked about the building of Cavartha Castle and how it was a family home to the Crochet family, Iron Masters at Cavartha Ironworks. This week we are going to look into one of the second incarnations of Kavartha Castle. After the Crochet family left, the building was used for two main things. One was a museum and art gallery and the other a school. But this week we are going to be looking at the museum and art gallery foundations and seeing the story behind that and seeing how Kavartha Castle came by such an eclectic collection of objects. But anyway... Without further ado, if you enjoy this episode, episode, please like and subscribe and share as much as possible and let us know what you think. On August the 19th, 1893, in the Weekly Mail newspaper, a letter appeared. This newspaper was wild, widely distributed in Merthyrville and the letter is as follows. The old home of the Iron King is literally denuded of furniture, with the exception of one room which is kept for very occasional visits. Make it, the castle, an interesting summer and winter resort. Many a Merthyr boy has been abroad to India, Africa and elsewhere, and the number of curios in this town is astonishing. A large number of geological specimens and fossils, Merthyr is wretchedly destitute of all places of social and pleasant gathering and, by the way, why resign to the rats to which would improve the lives of men and women? Now what that anonymous, I should say, letter writer is hinting at is something that many, many people hinted at about Cavartha Castle since the day the Crochet family left. So practically as soon as they left the house empty in 1889, there were calls for the borough to buy the house and to turn it into something that Merthyr people could benefit from. I mean, when you looked at Cavartha Park and Castle empty of the family, and so so much of the town was wanting parkland, museums, art galleries, something of culture, something, as he said, something ple- some places of pleasant social gatherings. Essentially, they just didn't want a town full of pubs, which is what they had. They didn't have many permanent art galleries or anything like that. And so what this person wanted was something along those lines a place of culture in the center of Merthyr and what better place Cavartha Castle now if you go back in time slightly there was a core group of people in Merthyr who were fundamentally trying to push arts and culture through the town and they were mainly the middle classes of Merthyr the burgeoning middle classes you know these local townspeople and local born people who had grown up and became wealthy from the town's industry they wanted places where they could go and experience seeing a piece of art experience seeing a piece of history and things like that so much so in fact that they started creating their own pop-up exhibitions and a large and very notable one appeared in 1880 in the drill hall at the end of Merthyr, at the end of Brecon Road in Merthyr Tidville. Now that exhibition was full, I mean absolutely packed of all manner of different art and sculptures and models and everything you can imagine honestly and it laid down this kind of foundation that it can be done and it can be a success in Merthyr because this exhibition in Merthyr Tidville they were kind of inspired by other places even as large scale as London and other places holding these great exhibitions to do the same in Merthyr and it was met with great success and so they repeated it several times in the drill hall But every time it had to end, it wasn't a permanent fixture. And so when Cavartha Castle was being earmarked to be bought by the local council, they felt 
that they could they had an opportunity to now maybe establish an art gallery or a museum in that building but they had an uphill battle for a start because Cavartha Castle was going to be purchased by the council in the early 1900s but it wasn't going to be purchased to be a museum and art gallery it was going to be purchased to become a school the parkland would be open to the public but the building would be a school now we will get into the history and the specifics of the school in a future episode of this podcast but for now the school was almost preventing the museum from existing but the school was way off the school was way off into the distance at this point because essentially they needed to convert the building for usage as a school which would take them around about three to four years the school wouldn't open until 1913 but Cavartha Park itself was open on June 1909 but then the castle was not open and so this was an opportunity for these local people who had been pushing for these exhibitions held in the drill hall and other places they wanted to hold one in the winter of 1909 in Cavartha Castle and open just the main reception rooms for this exhibition. The mayor of the time was Frank Trian James as well and he was one of the first people in giving a speech at the opening of the Winter Art Exhibition to say that the castle should be home to an exhibition of art by Penry Williams and that he's confident and hopeful that the council would convert rooms for that usage and so a lot of sway with a lot of important people including Frank Trian James were was needed to get this up off the ground really the winter art exhibition was also rapidly turning into not so much an art exhibition as an exhibition of um, a bewildering number of objects and artifacts in time periods but a lot of which had little to no connection apart from being owned and possessed by a person who lived locally one of the committee of people in charge with organizing the winter art exhibition in this year even gone in touch with the V&A the Victorian Albert Museum and borrowed some artifacts from them the Saudi family locally donated Egyptian artifacts amassed by Harry Harry Hartley Waite Saudi when he went to Egypt and various objects from uh, Japan as well as other parts around the world were given by the family to display so they were displaying mummy parts and various ushapti figures and sarcophagus lids within the museum for this exhibition artwork by thomas prather as well as lots as well as a lot more other artists were always on display throughout the building and frank trian james who was another founding member of the museum and was connected heavily to the great exhibitions if you want to call them in the drill hall donated a lot of oriental collections as he termed them and yeah curios from all over town were creeping out of the woodwork because everyone wanted to be a part of it it was really very much and i can't overstate this enough it was very much a community kind of exhibition where everyone was given a piece of the collection that they thought was very special and they just got it out on display and then opened it up to the public and what ensued was a massive success in terms of thousands upon thousands of people turning up and paying to get an entrance into this exhibition and there was indeed one whole room dedicated to the Merthyr born boy Penry Williams the artist who was nurtured to his full potential by the Iron Masters of Merthyr Tidville and so many various kind of benefactors and people of the town owned parts of Penry Williams's collection that they filled an entire room with Penry Williams and some people even said that the winter art exhibition should be better termed as a penry williams art exhibition because he's so dominantly present in the exhibition and heavily featured and he still is today in fairness as well he's very heavily featured as he should be and yeah astounding success so much so that not long after the plans for Kavartha castle school at that point were slightly amended because they then reserved the main reception rooms of the front of the building to keep that museum and art gallery section there because that literally put Kavartha castle on the map as a museum and art gallery because 
if that if that wasn't tried and attempted and wasn't a success then we wouldn't be talking i wouldn't be talking today i wouldn't have a job it wouldn't exist the exhibition was actually visited by over 6100 people in less than a month at the end of 1909 which is what pushed that permanent kind of fixture of Kavartha really and it was brought up by a gentleman who will pop into our story in another way in a sec and Isaac Williams who to put forward the building to be officially recognized as a museum and art gallery to go with the museums act of 1891 and officially declare it and put it into force as being a museum and art gallery permanently so going into early 1910, they essentially the plan was to open the exhibition for the winter period, but they just stayed open. They didn't close. And the objects out on display weren't so much now an exhibition, a pop-up exhibition. They were there permanently. And the majority of the objects there on display in that early exhibition, at the time that the doors opened, you can still find them on the walls of Kvartha Castle today. You'll still find Penry Williams paintings that were on display. You'll still find the procession and the christening above the fireplace in the round room, which was one of the paintings on display. You'll still find the Saudi Egyptian collection. You'll still find Frank Trian's uh, Oriental collection out on display. And you'll the more and more you go through the museum, the more from that original art exhibition, if you want to call it that, on display and it's an amazing thing really how many people will go to the museum nowadays and say oh it's changed this this is that but fundamentally it's more like the original museum now than it's been in quite a long time obviously with more floor space for wheelchair and pram access nowadays to be honest going into 1910 they didn't close as i said and so they just continued forward and so by the time they got to april they were still having literally thousands of visitors every week and so they decided well let's make this official and so they applied to become officially a museum and art gallery and get a proper curator in to do the job properly form a museum committee and that is what happened and so that we've got a museum curator who was named was isaac wilkinson Isaac Williams, sorry, Isaac Wilkinson is a Ryan master. Get confused with my Isaacs. But Isaac Williams, and he would actually be the art teacher and art master at Kavartha School as well as the curator. And he would eventually work for the National Museums of Wales as well, being one of their first founding kind of art experts, essentially. And that connection, again, really helps Kavartha going forward because the curators and people they have connected to the museum in in throughout history really use the people they know to constantly increase Kavartha's collection and not only that when we put ourselves on the map as a really good location to uh, a really good tourist location for people come in and for a place of culture in Merthyr the Crochet family actually came back and they were very proud of the fact that their old home is now the centre of culture. So they then started donating quite heavily to the museum collection, namely Robert Thompson Crochet Jr., who had an astounding collection of art and artefacts and family memorabilia and loads of stuff. And he gave like loads of silverware and loads of different objects and artefacts to the museum and then increased our collection gigantically, to be honest. And when you walk through the museum, it's really difficult to realise the blatant fact that everything in our museum is connected to Merthyr Tidville in some way. The museum would continue to grow as well. And even by April 1910, not long after it had been officially recognised as a museum and art gallery, they were reporting that the building had seen 18,354 people since it opened in 1909 in december 1909 which is a massive amount of visitors of visitors to be fair and they were even reporting on the fact that not just the crochet family were donating objects but local people were continuing to support and add really unique objects to the collections so people donating oil paintings of Kefili castle people donating 21 original chinese paintings of fish and shells and other figures needle 
artwork, pictures, engravings of the Kvartha ball. And it goes on and on and on. 50 steel engravings of Raphael's famous cartoons. And honestly, it continues forward and forward and forward. From watercolours to crayon pictures to pencil drawings. People were just giving and giving and giving because they saw the worth of giving to this museum. And Merthyr at that point was still... A quite a huge population and they were just giving and giving and giving so much so that in that first year or two of being opened certainly in the first decade Kavartha basically amassed pretty much the majority of the collection that's housed there now was all amassed during that first few years so we've got a collection of around 16,000 objects in the museum from different Roman artifacts to Egyptian artifacts to paintings to everything and the vast majority of that came in that early phase where that excitement of something new started and people wanting to be a part of it really captured the imagination of many, many people. And yeah, the collection is a testament to that. So in 1910, in that April, the museum almost relaunched itself and reopened and, and did a proper opening and had a proper guidebook and a proper opening leaflet. And in the, in the front cover of that opening leaflet were was an amazing little written bit of history that I love, to be honest. And it's still in the guidebook today, you know, if you pick up Kavartha Castle's guidebook. Um, and it says three rules to consider in the front cover of this guidebook. And the first rule is, remember the castle is ours. Let us appreciate and take care of it. Rule two, the pictures are not up on the wall for decoration of the walls, but for your sake, enjoy them to your heart's content. And then rule three, you were requested to enjoy yourself and to help others enjoy themselves. Now, what an amazing kind of m mission statement, if you will. This outright saying, look, this castle is not just a museum. This is our castle. The people of Merthyr has reclaimed this. It's an old Iron Master's home. But now the workers and the people of the town now own it. And now we are visiting it to see other people's collections from around the world and see other parts of history and art and culture from all over, really. It's also saying that the pictures are not just there, you know, for decoration. Just, just walk past them, look at them, appreciate them, try and gain and gather something from them that, that'll enrich your life. And then the third rule, try and help others. If they don't understand the art, don't just go, ah, oh, you're an ignorant git actually stand next to them and discuss and push that forward as to you know what how it makes you feel and discuss it and yeah it's an amazing little thing that and again we still at Kavathakas we still try to stand by and t try to take that as seriously as we can today to be honest the museum itself obviously and st obviously continued forward and still does now obviously I work there and things like that and I, I honestly genuinely believe that our ethos and our attitude hasn't changed a great deal <laughs> since that early opening. We still want Kavartha Castle to be a place of culture and for people to come and enjoy and take advantage of the art and the objects. We still want to increase our collection. We still get local people all the time bringing in artifacts and objects and of all manner and description. You can honestly, it's bewildering the amount of stuff that people come up with. And yeah, so the museum itself hasn't changed drastically. The methods in our display and interpretation have changed, obviously, but ultimately the building is still continuing on very much in the same light, in the same way as it did originally. And yeah, I hope that kind of gives you an indication of how Kavartha Castle started as a museum and art gallery and how it is continuing as a museum and art gallery to this very day. Well, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. I hope you've enjoyed finding out a bit more about the foundations of the Museum and Art Gallery at Kavartha Castle. And certainly I'm quite thankful for it, otherwise I wouldn't have a job. And yeah, next week we won't be looking at the third part in this trilogy, of Ka the Kavartha trilogy we'll call it. We won't be doing that, we'll be giving Kavartha Castle a little bit of a rest by the break and we'll be looking at a different castle from Merthyr. But we will be coming back to the subject of Kavartha Castle and we'll be talking about this foundation of the school of Kavartha Castle and how Kavartha Castle actually spawned not one school in Merthyr but actually 
forced another one to be built quite rapidly after and but that's an episode for another day so hopefully you've enjoyed listening to this week's episode please comment and share as much as possible and stay safe and thank you very much for listening